Hi, my name is Christian Ramirez, and I'm a 3D artist at Mold3D. In this lesson, I will cover the importance of establishing a texel density, using Quixel Mixer, vertex painting, layered materials, decals, and a little bit of set dressing. A few notes on UVs before getting started. One, it's very important to establish a texel density at the start of every project. This will help us establish a consistent level of resolution throughout all the assets within our scene. I will explain this a bit further in just a sec. Two, there are a few different ways of organizing our UVs for textures depending on the pipeline you choose to work with. For Slay, we use the most common method, which is laying out the UVs within the boundaries of the 0 to 1 space. Keeping our UVs within the 0 to 1 space gives us the opportunity to work with programs such as Substance Painter or Photoshop. Typically, this method is used for small to medium sized assets that will be closer to the camera and need a more unique hero look in order for them to stand out within the environment. However, sometimes our assets might be too large for us to be able to organize its UVs within the 0 to 1 space. This means we have to expand our UVs outside the boundaries of the 0 to 1, but that's okay. This means we have to texture our assets inside Unreal using tileable textures. This is where the importance of establishing a texel density comes in. The texel density will help us determine which assets will be able to fit within the 0 to 1 space and get unique textures and which assets will need to be textured inside Unreal using tileable textures. So let me show you an example of what I mean. I created here three cubes at three different scales. Uh, the first one I set to 50, the second one I set to 100, and the third I set to 500. And our goal here is to figure out which of our assets UVs will fit within the zero to one space and will have unique textures and which of our assets will have to be textured in Unreal uh, using tileable textures. Uh, so let's say we decide to work with a texel density of 512, or in this case, 5.12, since we're working in a real world scale where one centimeter equals one meter. So let's go ahead and set our texel density to 5.12 and a map size to 1024. Let's go ahead and select all our uh, cubes here, select our UVs, and let's set them to this texel density. Uh, so as you can see, cube C is way too large to fit within our zero to one. Let's check cube B. Uh, cube B is a little bit closer, but still a little bit too big to fit inside the zero to one at a map size of 1024. Cube A, however, looks like fits just right. Maybe I'll have to make it a little bit smaller, but that's no big deal. There you go. So cube A can definitely fit uh, inside a map size of 1024 with a texel density of 512. Let's go ahead and go uh, a map size higher, 20, uh, 2048. Select our cube B. And let's set this uh, cube to uh, a texel density of 5.12, but with a map size of 2048. As you can see, with a texel density of 512 and a map size of 2048, our, our, uh, medium, our medium cube, cube B, can now fit within the 0 to 1. Let's go ahead and try the same with our cube C. So again, we increased our map size to 2048, still at a texel density of 5.12. Let's go ahead and set that uh, texel density. Now, as you can see, even at a map size of 2048, cube C is still way too large. Let's go higher up, 4096. Still too large, um, which makes this a perfect candidate for us to uh, texture this asset inside Unreal using tileable textures. This is because even if we were to go to uh, 8096, let's see. Even at 8096, which is an 8K map, our larger cube would not be able to fit within our zero to one space. 
making it impossible for us to texture inside Substance Painter or Photoshop. The only way for us to texture this would be using tileable textures inside Unreal. So now that we have an understanding of why we would use tileable textures, we can talk about Mixer. We use Mixer because it provides us with a large library of realistic textures that we can work with right off the bat. In Mixer, we can quickly create multiple variations of the same texture that we can apply in UE using a vertex painting material. So let's start a new mix. Just name it uh, Example Mix. We'll set our working resolution to uh, 4096, hit OK. Quick note before we get started, if you're working on a 4K monitor, the uh, text and the UI might be a little bit small. An easy way to fix this is by going to Edit, Preferences, and if you go to uh, User Interface, yeah, Scale UI. Now we can see a little bit better. Something I really enjoy about Mixer is that it's a pretty straightforward program to learn. Of course, like anything, it takes some time to get comfortable with it, but as a person who gets very easily overwhelmed with noisy UI, uh, I appreciate how user-friendly Mixer can be. Let me demonstrate how you can quickly put together a texture with multiple variations uh, that we can use for our vertex painting material. So let's go to our uh, local library. So everything you see here are the default tools Mixer has for you to work with. Uh, let's look at some surfaces. Uh, so these are it here. All right, let's see. Let's find a brick material. Um, okay, this one looks good. So all you have to do is select, download, wait a couple seconds. It's usually pretty quick. All right, once it's downloaded, you can go back to your local library. And it should be right here. All right. So let's use this brick as a base. So going back to how easy this uh, interface is, uh, let me show you around a little bit. First thing, we can turn our displacement maps on and off with a quick click of a button. We can also preview our tiling to help us spot some obvious areas of repetition within our texture that we may not want. All right, let's get back to our texture. So our goal here is to have a base and create at least three different versions of this that we can use for our vertex painting material. So let's, put, let's look for some plaster that we can throw on top. Again, don't think we're gonna have anything on our local library. So let's go to our online library. Let's see, plaster. Sure, this one works. Download. All right, looks like it's downloaded. Now let's just go back to our local library. There it is. All we have to do to uh, throw it into our layers, we can either uh, click and drag, or you could just double click. All right, so now it's, uh, let's untile our material. All right. So now this is what it looks like with our rough plaster layered on top. Uh, let's go back to a flat plane for now. Let's go ahead and change the height of our uh, rough plaster. So as you can see, Mixer allows you to quickly blend a multitude of, multitude of uh, materials for you to create limited variations of whatever tileable textures you need. All right, so let's say I want a thick layer of plaster layered on top of our uh, brick. You can also change the blend radius from one texture to another, like so. Cool, that looks good. And my goal for this texture here is to have a thick layer of plaster, but we still want to have some brick poking out a little bit. Another cool thing about Mixer is that you're not limited to only using uh, surfaces. Let's see, if we wanted to add a little bit more detail that we couldn't find on a tileable texture, we can look up some uh, decals that we can throw on. Let's see. Maybe we want to throw uh, some kind of patchwork on our texture. 
This one, sure. Download, once again, wait for a quick download. Go back to our local library. Let's switch over to Atlas. I know them as decals. Throw it on. And the cool part about it is that just like the tileable textures, you also have options in terms of height, blend radius, and you can also preserve the detail. You can also move it around. Let's see on the X. One cool thing about it too, is that if you move it too far down the X axis or Y, the decal becomes tileable as well. Another great tip for when you're working on tileable materials uh, or textures is that you can also use mask to mask out certain areas of your texture for maybe areas you don't like or to make your textures look a little less repetitive. So let's turn off our decals. Uh, or in this case, let's say uh, we didn't want this bottom portion to be covered in plaster. We just wanted it the clean brick. So let's go ahead and mask out this area. And as you can see, Mixer takes care of the tiling for you. So if you erase something on this side, it'll affect the other side as well, or vice versa in, in terms of up and down. Clean this area up. And you have a couple different brushes here that you can use for different areas. And if we go back to our uh, layer settings here, you'll see that only the masked area or the unmasked area will be affected. Cool. All right, so uh, let's find a third element to throw on our material here. Let's say, Let's throw on, let's throw on some, let's see, some snow. Let's go back to our surfaces. Uh, let's find some snow. This one will do. Download. Cool, now that it's downloaded, back to our local library. Change over to surfaces. There's our snow. Once again, you can just mess around with the settings to your liking. Cool, that looks good. Now, all we have to do is export our maps. So to do that, we go to export, uh, select our location in which we want to save our uh, maps in, uh, set at, select the uh, texture preset. We have two, uh, metalness maps or specular maps. We'll stick with metalness for this and select the kind of maps that you want uh, Mixer to spit out for you. So in this case, we want albedo, roughness, normal, possibly displacement, we'll leave that, and we'll check. Well, we need AO, and yeah, <laughs> we pretty much, we need them all. Let's see, let's select our location. Let's create a new folder. Uh, asset name, example mix is fine. Uh, we want to set our map size to, uh, let's go 4K for this one. And keep in mind our material or our texture is pretty simple, but uh, they can get pretty complex, which does increase the export time. Another great feature of Mixer and my preferred method of exporting when working on any project is using Quixel Bridge. We can export the material we created into Bridge and from Bridge over to Unreal. This is particularly helpful when you find yourself in need of exporting packed maps, uh, which is something you can't currently do from Mixer. So all we would have to do is uh, set our export target to library rather than custom, our asset name to whatever you're choosing, 
Uh, in this case, we'll just go with example and uh, example mix. Uh, our asset type is a surface uh, asset category. In this case, uh, I created a custom one, which is our vertex painting uh, category. Our, uh, our texture presets, library surface maps um, is fine. And now let's just set our texture resolution. We'll leave it at 4K. We'll export. I had already done a test run for this, so we'll just hit replace. And now once it's done exporting, let's go to bridge. Let's go down to our local tab, um, mixer. And as you can see, I had already exported our, our material uh, uh, in the past. So that's the reason as to why there's three of them in here. But now that it's in here, we can select it. And all we'd have to do is set our resolution to 4K. In our case, since we exported our maps in 4K, hit export. And it will quickly throw it over to Unreal. And these are our maps. It even gives you a preset material for you to just throw it on to uh, any assets that you need it on. Now let's jump on over to Unreal to learn about our vertex painting material. All right, let's cover vertex painting. Vertex painting gives you the ability to paint with up to four different textures, all under one material. However, we set our limit to three for this project because it can be a bit expensive. And the project's performance is something you always have to keep in mind. I'll be showing the vertex material that we used for uh, the main center tower. This is a good example because we created three different versions of our wood planks texture for us to work with. Let's locate it and open it up. So as you can see, we have three different versions here. Our first, which is our base, uh, which are the white planks with a little bit of wear. Our second, which is our mid layer, which are our white planks clean. And our top layer, which is the uh, white planks dirty. And in here you can see that not only did we input our maps, but we also have some control in terms of our base color to saturation, base color tint, base color tint intensity, our normal map intensity. So even after applying the, uh, the textures to the wall, we still have some control over how we want our textures to be displayed. But first, Let's talk about how we'll actually apply and paint on these surfaces. So the first thing we want to do is select our geo. Um, let's go to modes. Change over to mesh paint. Now we get our options up here. We get our, uh, the main tools that we'll be using is uh, paint and remove. So let's go ahead and remove all our paint, which will reveal our top layer, which is our white planks dirty. And now with only our top layer visible, let's switch over to paint. With our paint color set to black, which we can switch using the X key, we need to make sure that our red, green, and blue channels are all checked on. And now let's make our brush a little bit smaller. Now you'll see that I can start to reveal our base layer, which is our white planks with wear. Now, if we check off our green channel and switch our mask over to white, I can now start to reveal our clean white planks. An important thing to remember when it comes to working with vertex painting in UE is that the paintable canvas on your asset is determined by the amount of vertices it has. Uh, so for example, let's go to Maya. I'm going to go ahead and create two planes. So I'm, I want one of our planes to have 148 vertices and the other uh, plane to have only four. 
One, two, three, four. Let's go ahead and export these out. Let's throw them in. All oh, this is fine. Import. Let me go back to select here. All right. Throw in our, uh, it's fine. Uh, let's switch over to select uh, so I can move my asset around. So our plane with uh, 148 vertices is located on the right and the one with only four is on the left. So let's go ahead and throw on our tileable material on it. Let's search for it here. All right, so as you can see, only our uh, wooden plane sturdy uh, can be seen. Let's switch on over back to uh, mesh paint. Let's select these. Paint tool. We want to switch over to our black mask. Let's select, make sure our, all our channels are selected, red, green, and blue. And let's start painting. So let's start with the, uh, the plane with only four verts. As you can see, our transition from one texture to another is very limited. It's, it's based on only these four verts. You won't have a lot of range in terms of transitioning from one texture to another. As opposed to uh, our plane with 148 verts, you'll see that we'll have a much cleaner, much smoother transition. So if you plan on using a vertex painting material on any asset, do make sure you have enough vertices for you to work with. And there's really no set number for this process. If four verts is all you need, that's definitely okay. So now let's move on over to another material we used, which is very similar to their vertex painting material. This is what we call a layered material. Whereas our vertex painting material uses three different versions of the same texture, our layered material uses two different types of textures and one other version of each. So let's open it up so we can take a closer look. So as you can see, our layered material has two versions of plaster and two versions of brick. Uh, one being a clean brick, uh, and the other damaged, and the same for our plaster. It's a clean plaster and a damaged plaster. And again, as you can see, you have a multitude of options here that you can play with uh, when it comes to base color, roughness, tiling, normal strength. But another big difference of this layered material as opposed to our vertex painting material is that it gives us the ability to blend within each texture by using a height map. Let me show you. So as you can see here, we have some brick and some plaster painted on top. Let's go over to our paint tool. Let's make our brush size a little bit smaller. I think I had the wrong thing selected. There you go. All right. So see, I'm revealing a little bit of our uh, brick texture underneath. I can do the opposite by switching my uh, mask to white and paint over our brick. But to demonstrate the height blend capabilities, again, let me bring this over. Here you can see we can create a smoother transition from one texture to another. And again, that's one of the greater benefits of using a layered material, the option to blend within each texture. But again, unfortunately, these kind of materials are very expensive. So you do have to be careful in as to which assets you use it for. Uh, in, in this case, these assets are pretty close to the camera and going back to a previous lesson, they were a bit too big for us to texture and substance painter. 
So our best choice was to texture in, in UE. And another added benefit of uh, working directly in UE is that you don't have to go through the whole process of going back to Substance Painter or Photoshop, you know, make your changes, export those maps out, re-import into UE, and set up your material again. Uh, with the layered material or with the paint, uh, or with the vertex painting material, you can just apply directly onto your mesh, making the texturing process much quicker, especially when it comes to working as part of a team. This allows you to adapt and make changes on the spot if needed. Unfortunately, vertex painting and layered materials can only take you so far into the texturing process. So in order to develop our texture a bit further, we also have the use of decals, which are basically stickers that you can use to overlay even more detail. For example, these leaks, uh, some of these cracks uh, that you can see here where the uh, wood meets the structure, and even details that sometimes you would think were modeled in, such as this trim here. And decals are projection based. So you can even use them on two independently textured assets and create a more natural look without the hassle of having to line things up within the texture map. So we'll take this leaks decal. And as you can see, it appears on both these wood planks and our plaster here. And on the opposite end of that, decals can also be used to hide common anomalies seen when working in the 3D world, such as harsh lines created when two assets intersect. Let me show you. So areas like this, where our ground floor, which is a separate asset, meets these concrete slabs. You can see you get these unnatural looking seams. So an easy way to cover those up is by adding a decal with a little bit of shrubbery on it. This helps hide those anomalies. The final subject I'll be covering is set dressing. A great way to approach set dressing is by breaking things up into three categories. Your primary shapes, your secondary shapes, and finally your tertiary shapes. Your primary shapes being our center temple, these uh, watchtowers, our center temple gate, basically the bigger shapes that create your silhouette. Your secondary shapes would be the uh, smaller statues, um, the gravestones, let me get up closer here, the gravestones, the, uh, the fencing, the railing, and finally your tertiary shapes, which would be your debris, your weeds growing between the, uh, the tiles, uh, and the smaller props. Uh, but before jumping in and placing things randomly around the environment, the key really is to find good real life reference. Uh, in this case, we were inspired by Asian culture, uh, mainly Japanese architecture and architecture, and wanted to bring those elements to the sleigh environment. The next step is to think about what story you would like to convey. Is this temple newly built or has it been abandoned for some time? These can seem like small and significant details but can represent curious story elements to the viewer. But not only is set dressing meant to make things look pretty or give you an insight into the world, uh, it can also help us frame the composition for the viewer. As an example, let me go down here to the entrance. Let me get rid of some of this stuff. Or let's just hit F11 to uh, to make our screen a little bigger here. So for example, these statues, gravestones, and pillars help us establish a path for the eyes to follow by creating visual noise at the bottom section and a more peaceful place at the top where we see the main temple. 
This is a good example of balance within your composition, where we have focus areas to rest the eyes, but also an interesting area within the comp for the viewer to journey through. And these are the kind of thoughts going through our head when adding wild grass growing between the tiles or making sure things aren't lined up perfectly like the water drains uh, or the debris accumulating in the corners. So in conclusion, the things to keep in mind when set dressing are reference, story, and composition. Thank you so much for listening. I hope you learned a thing or two.